Okay, I'm putting together this audio book summary. So this is going to contain the basics and the meat and potatoes of the book itself. And we're going to get right to it because I know there is a lot of information that we're going to cover. So a little bit about the book and a little bit about myself. I have been training dogs and training people to train dogs for the past 11 years. So that's when my journey actually began. And when I say 11 years, that's at the time of this recording. And that was actually my first. So 11 years ago at this time, it was my first introduction into full on, fully submerged dog training. I don't mean I got my first dog 11 years ago. I don't mean I trained my dog 11 years ago. I don't do, you know, that bumping of my resume by just adding the years that I've been working with dogs on a passive manner. Like, I mean, fully submerged. Obviously, I can tell you I've had dogs and I've been around dogs my whole life, but fully, fully into it about 11 years ago, so the 2009 specifically, my first dog training school. And from there, I've been involved in different areas of dog training from working with protection dogs, police dogs. I've done scent detection. I've done uh, uh, service dog training, pet, pet obedience. I spent 18 months in Afghanistan working with the contract working dogs, so not the military working dogs, but the civilian side of the working dogs. I've been to two different dog training schools. I teach at one currently, and I have been to several seminars, uh, training camps, all related to dog training. So I've been very, very fortunate to have done quite a bit in the dog training industry. So that's a little bit about myself. What the book is, the book itself has a bunch of articles that I wrote several years ago, over the years really, I mean from several years ago to the most recent articles being written not too, too long ago. And what the book does is it contains all these articles. They're categorized by, um, you know, by section. We have sections here on how to avoid burnout, how to get started, um, how to stay motivated, and even, uh, you know, some safety stuff. That's what the book contains, and that's what these articles are going to be on. So let's dive right into it. First section of the book is going to be dog training career. So here we are focusing specifically on people that are just starting out. So if you are looking into this as a potential career, you're looking at this as, you know, maybe I want to switch careers. Maybe I want to, you know, do something new. I don't like what I've been doing for the past 10, 20 years. Or like a lot of the students that we have, which is more like, okay, I got I got out of school and now what? You know, I just finished high school. I just graduated from college. Not quite what I wanted to do. And now I feel like I want to work with dogs. So where do I go from here? So this section is specifically made for you guys. First section right here, first article is going to be, so you want to be a dog trainer, uh, read this first. So I'm going to kind of touch on, on the main, I'm not going to read every single, um, you know, every single line. It's just it's way too long. Uh, the whole audio book, if you want to get the whole audio book, that's hours and hours of content. So I'm going to just kind of get the main stuff that I know you want to get. Right, so the main thing is if you want to be a dog trainer, first thing is you need to get a little bit of a reality check and realize that dog training is more than just playing with puppies all day long. That it's more than just petting dogs and teaching dogs how to play dead. And that's one of the things that I emphasize in this article is most people, and this is through my experience also working with a lot of students who want to become dog trainers, is most people have this false expectation of what dog training actually is. And when they are a couple of years into the industry, they realize 
that it is a lot more work than they thought it would be. Uh, they don't realize that this can be exhausting. They don't realize that it is sometimes six days or even seven days per week of hard work in the beginning at least. There's a lot of studying. There's a lot of putting in the effort. There's a lot of getting your hands dirty. And there's a lot of hands-on education that you're just going to have to do. And I'm not trying to sound pessimistic, as I say in the book. This is just how it is. If you already feel like, you know, me saying this is me trying to push her away, honestly, I, I think it's the best thing for you. I can't tell you how many times we have students that come to our program and they either leave halfway because it's just too much work. I actually had that happen not too long ago. I had a couple of students just come up and tell us this is too much, more than I thought it would be. And that's just the schooling. That's not even the full dog training industry. Like once you start your business or once you start working with somebody else, that's another thing that I notice a lot, not just from students, but from people in general. You know, all the dog trainers who don't necessarily come to the school. I see that a lot. So if you are interested in becoming a dog trainer, if you're looking at this as a potential career, you have got to get it out of your head that this is easy. You have got to get it out of your head that this is all fun and games because it is fun. I love this. This is great. And you are going to be working with cute puppies. That is part of the gig. But you have to realize that it is also work. At some point, it's going to be exhausting. And there is going to be a little bit of burnout here and there. As long as you understand that, then I guarantee you, it's definitely one of the best ways to make money by doing something that, that is actually very, very interesting. Okay, so next section here is going to be you know, how to choose the right dog training school. So how to choose the, the right dog training school is that could be your next step. You know, then you realize, okay, maybe this is something I do want to do. Now I'm going to look at potentially going to dog training schools. And once again, this is a little bit of a summary of the chapter. Here's the thing. There's, there's different things to look at when it comes to dog training schools. One uh, is it something that you can afford? And here's the thing. Doctrine schools, they come in different price tags. Doctrine schools that I went to, both the doctrine schools that I went to, that was about a 10 grand, 10 grand uh, program per, per school. Now, the first one, they didn't take the, the GI Bill. So this is a VA benefit. Um, so I had to get a loan and that was a $10,000 loan that I had to take and it was pretty pricey and a lot of people cannot afford that. Okay. Uh, the second doctor in school that I, that I went to, they do take that GI bill. So I, I didn't have to pay for that necessarily, but I do know that it is also an investment. It, it is about another 10 grand right there. Uh, all the doctor in schools are right around the same. Um, you know, a little bit less, give or take, but it's not something that's going to cost you, you know, $200. Uh, so that's the thing with dog training schools. They are an expense. Uh, they are definitely, uh, it's an investment and you want to do your research. Okay. Um, the two dog training schools that I went to, I did a lot of research. I didn't just look up dog training school and click on the first link. Um, now, the first dog training school that I went to is uh, US Canine Unlimited in Louisiana. This was back in 2009 when I went. The program was great. Uh, I got to work with the owner and his staff. Uh, they still run the program to this day, the dog training program. They still, uh, now they do take the GI Bill, from my understanding. And the second school I went to is uh, Triple Crown Academy, which is now called Starmark Academy. Uh, so I'm a big fan of those two schools. Obviously, there are other schools out there. There are other programs out there that I still want to be part of that if I could do it over again, I definitely would not do anything different, but I would 
strongly consider going to some of the other doctrine schools that I'm that there are out there now. now. I'm not going to bash nor promote any particular doctrine schools. I'm just telling you the ones I went to. And the reason I'm not going to promote or bash is because very simple management changes. I could bash a doctrine school right now and tell you, man, I, I really could. At this moment, there are a couple of doctrine schools that I've heard nothing but bad things about, uh, but they are very popular, and I've heard horrible things about these schools. However, the reason I'm not going to start bashing is because I know management changes. Uh, if I bash them now, but you know, two years, three years from now, they get their act together, uh, management changes, and it gets way, way better, then obviously the bashing will be inaccurate at that time. Same thing if I endorse the school and I go, man, this school is the best. You have to go to the school. This is an awesome school. But then management changes or the instructors change and the quality of the school goes dramatically down, then obviously the endorsement won't be accurate. So you have to do your research. And I did my research. I consider a lot of schools and I... Uh, went to those two. They were uh, a few years apart. I didn't go to them back to back. I uh, also want to look at different uh, methodologies. You know, not every doctrine school is the same. First doctrine school I went to was mostly for police dog training, protection dog training. Uh, there was a lot of tasks involved, a lot of teaching of the mechanics. I learned a lot, um, but it was a little bit on the heavy handed side uh, where if if you're a purely positive, purely positive tr type person or trainer and you go to one of those schools, you're maybe not going to enjoy it quite as much. So definitely look into what kind of schools there are that you feel comfortable with. In general, I recommend that you are open-minded. That's why you go into a doctrine school to learn more. Uh, that's why you do your research. But at the same time, you, know, you don't want to go to a doctrine school where you're constantly going to be uncomfortable. So you have to be careful with that. And um, <clears throat> the other thing about doctrine schools is you have to consider the other thing is, do you do well under pressure? This is a lot of work. Both those doctrine schools that I went to were very uh, hands-on, very just all in. Like it was up six in the morning and, you know, short lunch breaks and training, training and more training. It was definitely a lot of work, and this is something that I hear from certain students from time to time that complain about the workload, which in, I think is a little bit funny because they complain about the workload in a dog training school. They don't have, they don't realize, they have no idea how heavy of a workload it can be once they start working with clients, where success is not measured in grades, it's measured in complaints uh, or a lot of money. So the workload is just there to stay, guys. If you cannot handle the pressure of a dog training school, because they're not going to hold your hands. They're not going to take it easy on you. They're going to teach you, but it's not one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's class environment. They're going to help you the best, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to keep up. You have to put in the work. So the other thing, the last thing that I want to touch on with this article is when you do your research, contact previous graduates to give you a more accurate description of what the school is, the schools that you're looking into. So a couple of people, a few people to, to look at, to be aware of is the cheerleaders. You're going to have previous graduates, which if you call a school and you go, Hey, I'm interested in going to your school. Uh, do you have a list of graduates that I can contact? That way they can tell me a little bit about your experience. That's one thing I did, and I'm telling you, it's really, really helpful. If you go to the Doctrine School's website, it's just going to be all great on the website. They're going to try to get you to sign up. You're going to call the representative, and they're going to give you the tour, and they're going to just uh, pretty much you know, kiss your ass until and, and try to get you to go to the school. Um, but if you go, hey, can I have a list of your graduates? They should be able to provide you with that. That way you can talk to a bunch of people. Uh, or you can go to the Facebook dog groups and ask, hey, you know, has anybody gone to this school? Has anybody gone to that school? 
And then you'll get a, a number of people that will tell you, yes, I have, or they'll tell you, do not go to that school. Or that will tell you, oh, that was the best school ever, right? And those are the, basically the three people you need to be aware of when you do your research and when you talk to people. You have the cheerleaders. These are the people that are very optimistic. Uh, definitely good people to talk to. But you have to be careful. Cheerleaders are just in general very optimistic in everything. I'm a very optimistic person. If you give me, um, if, if you if you give me lemons, I'm gonna try to make the best lemonade that I can. Um, so I may not tell you about the the seeds. I'm not might not tell you about the rind, but I'm gonna tell you about how great that lemonade was. And, uh, and that's kind of what you have to be aware of with the cheerleaders. If you contact a disgruntled student, you're gonna, they're going to tell you, hey, this school sucked bad, so don't go to that school. You have to be careful with that too because the disgruntled students, they generally have a very pessimistic outlook on life or at the time they had a very pessimistic outlook. And so all you're going to get is just negative, 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 negative. So you have to take that with a grain of salt too. Somewhere in the middle, that's the best place to, to go, right? Find somebody or a handful of people that tell you, hey, it was great because of this, this, and this. And it was bad because this, this, and this. That way you know exactly what you're walking into and you're not surprised. And last thing, do not talk to people who have never actually gone to the school. This is something I emphasize in the book. There are people that have never even gone to a doctrine school but are very, very opinionated about certain doctrine schools. They'll tell you, I've never been to that school, but I would never go to that school. It's horrible. It's terrible. They do this and this and that. And you're like, well, have you gone to the school? And I'm like, no. So I personally, I will not take the opinion of somebody uh, on a topic that they have no experience on. So be careful with those people too. And that's kind of the end of that chapter. Uh, next chapter, this is, um, you know, this chapter that I'm going to go to. Okay, so I have a few chapters on this topic, and I'm going to just read one of them because the rest are pretty much an expansion of those. And that is, you know, again, kind of going in the doctrine and career. If you haven't noticed already, there are, there are pretty much two two schools of thought when it comes to dog training. There is balanced and there is force free or purely positive. So all these three articles that I write, they have their own different uh, angles. They have their own different uh, pulls. Uh, one, of it, one, of them, one of the articles I wrote is very unbiased. So very in the middle. Uh, the other two articles I wrote are more more partial towards what I feel is the best approach. So again, um, I'm not going to bore you with the entire thing. I know you got a lot of things to do, but I'm going to give you the main here. So balance versus force free. So to summarize that, those three entire articles, dog training, this is going to be interesting to summarize, but bear with me. So dog training you have the soft approach, the let's not touch the animal, let's not hurt the animal. Everything should be fun and everything should be great and everything should be, um, you know, very positive. And then you got, you know, your extreme, like old school trainers who are more of your, the dog has to do it because I said so. You know, it's my dog. You got to be the pack leader. You got to dominate the dog. You got to do that. Like those are the main extremes. But the ones that I talk about in the book, in these three articles, are not the the latter extreme. It's not the, the old school heart extreme. It's more of a balance, so somewhere in the middle, and the purely positive, because those are the two primary driving forces in the dog training industry today. The old school trainers, they're 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 phasing out. They're not they're not even a, a thing anymore. They're a thing of the past. Now in the past, it wasn't like that was a huge deal. It's just how you train dogs in the past, it's how you trained animals in the past. This is how you raised kids in the past. It was like you gotta get it done. If it doesn't get done today, we're gonna make sure it gets done, right? This is 
the mentality that we had when uh, we reared children all the way to how we, we trained animals. Today, that's not something you see very much. And again, depending on when this audio is, uh, when you hear this audio, today could be who knows when. But today, at this moment, we have the purely positive, huge driving force in the dog training industry, and we have the balanced trainers, which is, hey, did I get it? We want to be all positive, but we also want to be able to implement some pressure, some boundaries. The dog needs to also be able to understand what no means. And that those seem to be the extremes today, not the old school trainers, but the balanced and the purely positive. The thing is, there is a lot of ignorant people in both. There are purely positive trainers that claim to be purely positive that really don't know what purely positive actually means. They just like the idea of purely positive, but they don't understand fully what it entails, the concept, or even how to properly approach dog training from a purely positive angle. What I mean by that is I've seen purely positive trainers lose their patience and not be very purely positive into the dogs that they're working with. And you also have ignorant people in the you know balanced community where I see, I have seen a lot of crank and yankers, a lot of old school trainers disguised as balanced trainers. And there's just ignorance. Properly labeled balanced trainers are very well versed in positive approach, but they're also very well versed in the other, you know, like the pressure, the proper use of pressure, the proper use of training tools, the proper implementation of boundaries, and teaching the dog what no also means. Properly implemented, the, the purely positive side knows everything also about operant conditioning, but they just have more of a moral issue with using training tools. Because this is the unbiased version of the of the article. Um, you know, I'm being very in the middle, so I'm gonna tell you, look, if you're gonna be purely positive, be purely positive and understand what it means. And purely positive is great. You know, it's great for training puppies, it's great for enhancing behaviors, it's great for teaching new behaviors. Uh, it's great for all of that. Balanced training. Also great for a bunch of other things. You know, everything purely positive. Plus, there is going to be some things that I'm going to need to use pressure for. This is going to be when I do my aversive type of training, which, hang on, I know you heard aversive and you might be freaking out right now. But by aversive, what I mean is, you know, snake, snake proofing, crittering, things that are potentially life-saving either for the dog or for other animals. So in general, you know, uh, force-free training and balanced training, if properly implemented, could definitely, you know, be of good value. At the end of the day, you know, this is something uh, is a reoccurring theme throughout the book. You have to do what's best for the dog, not for you not for your moral compass, not for your movement. This isn't about group identity. This is about what is best for the animal. Is it at some point going to be best for the animal to use pressure? That depends on the individual. Is it best for the animal that I stay off of pressure and entirely work on purely positive approach? That depends entirely on the animal and the situation. I'm not going to go into a training situation with any dog and go, where's my prong collar? I need to look at what the, the dog needs, and that will determine what my approach is going to be. Overall, I would like to be more on the positive side and then kind of work my way to different stages of pressure if I need to. All right, so a little bit more. Um, 
you know, one thing that I know that I, that I wrote is a little bit on business because I, I did I do have a little bit of experience with that as well. Uh, I f- consider myself uh, an entrepreneur. Obviously, if you're reading, if you are um, listening to this audio, this was an entrepreneurial um, journey as well. This is something that I've been kind of uh, doing for a long time, my side hustle. I do work for a company right now, but I have always kind of had um, you know, aspirations to do something on my own. So even though I do work for a, a dog training school, I also have been um, getting my own source of income for the past few years. Uh, maybe even before that. So I have a couple of articles on that, you know, how to get clients and maybe some things that that are preventing you from getting clients. So I'm going to summarize those two articles into one. So one, ways to get clients. Here's what has worked for me, and I outline more detail on this in the book. And if you get the full audiobook, it is in more detail on there as well. Ways to get clients, you have to be willing to throw yourself out there a little bit and just kind of jump in the deep end. And it doesn't mean that you have to do scary things. All it means is you have to do little things that will expose you. One thing that worked great for me, and I know it's a little scary now that I think about it, you know, it takes uh, it takes a little bit of courage, but really not that much actually. Is I would go to local libraries, which every town has one, even a small town usually has one, and every library has an adult learning program, and libraries like to get the community involved, so they'll have programs where they actually have free classes you could find programs for you know learning spanish uh, computer software uh, business development so i just go to those libraries and i go hey i have a um i have a class that i would like to give it's like a powerpoint presentation and some videos it's going to be very short very entertaining and it's going to be on simple topics like how to prevent common behavior problems like how to stop your dog from jumping um you know so that's kind of what i do i'll I'll, I'll actually schedule it with the library the library is usually very excited to do this because now it's you know more it's about dogs they're getting the community involved and they're very happy to promote for you so you do that and you schedule it they do all the promoting for you that's the beautiful thing like they promote it for you. They send newsletters. They have flyers even, depending on the library. They have their signs there at the library so people that go into the library can see that you have something scheduled, something coming up. That they have the, the presentation comes, you just show up with your computer. They usually have a projector. And you just play some videos. You go over the PowerPoint and you answer some questions very very simple so basically a free group class without dogs it's an opportunity to get your name out there get the name of your business out there um for people to get to know you get to see a face coupled with your business name and it's a great way to to uh to do a sales pitch without them realizing it you know because at the end of that this is just a short presentation you're not going to give them a five hour long death by powerpoint presentation you're going to keep it fun entertaining very informational by the end of the day by the end of that presentation they're going to feel like they trust you they know you and then now they have your contact info they got your flyers they got your business cards i've done that and it has gotten me business for months to come um so something very simple to get clients like that Uh, another thing that i did and that I recommend to people that get into the dog training industry is go to a boarding facility. Boarding facility that doesn't have a dog trainer staffed. Go to them 
and tell them, hey, I noticed that, you know, you probably have some runs uh, in your slower seasons that don't get occupied. How would you like it if, uh, you know, if we pair up and I can board some of, uh, you know, or I can take some of your clients, some of your boarding clients. I just stop by and do like, uh, you know, some day training, right? This very, you arrange the fee and basically they do the boarding. You stop by, you do some basic obedience, some basic lessons. It's a win for the boarding facility because now they are quote unquote offering training and their clients are doing more with their dogs than just boarding them. Another thing that you can do with boarding facilities, something that I did, worked great for me, is create a sign-up sheet for group classes. So schedule it, you know, like for a month ahead or so. And bring the sign-up sheet to the boarding facility, all ready to go. All they have to do is write their name. Tell the boarding facility, hey, listen, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm the dog trainer here in town. Um, I know you have clients that board their dogs. I'm going to leave this uh, sign-up sheet here with you, if that's okay with you. And any of your clients that signs up to my group class, you get a percentage of that client that signs up to my group class. And usually they're very happy to do that. I did that with a boarding facility at the place that, at the town that I was working at. And it worked out great. Uh, the person was very excited about it. It's a local business owner and she was excited about it. She was like, that, that's awesome. Yeah, leave your sign up sheet here. And she was pushing all of her clients to it because the more of her clients signed up, the more money she got back. So basically she's getting a referral fee for her clients putting their names and signing up on my group class. So very, very easy way to promote your business right there. And you're not even doing a whole lot, right? Um, so little things like that that you can do to promote your business. Uh, and, and another thing too that I, this is now going into the second article on business, running a business and getting clients, is you have to, you have to make sure too that your prospect clients that they do get to know you, that they do get to trust you. And you have to understand that it's not all about certificates. It's not all about years of experience. Um, it's not all about you should do business with me because I'm the best dog trainer here. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they do need to get to know you. And they don't even care about the certificates on your wall. They don't really care about the trophies. They really don't. I see dog trainers that, I mean, it's not bad. You know, it's great that they have, they're proud of all their accomplishments. I see dog trainers that have their walls covered in trophies and medals and certificates, which some of them are not very hard to get. And I mean, they're getting business and I see trainers that don't have any of those that are getting tons of business. So it's, you know, it's not about a job interview. It's not about be, being a pushy salesperson. It's about creating that trust and making a connection with the client over, you know, trying to impress them with your certificates and your background and, you know, trying to shove your merchandise and your services down their throat. So again, I go into more detail than that. But to summarize those two articles, throw yourself out there, think creatively to promote your business. And when you do get yourself in front of prospect clients, realize that there is more to it than just being a salesperson. Uh, and then, you know, quote unquote, years of experience or certificates on your shelves or on your wall. So that's pretty much that section right there we're going to go to a different section now this is this is one of my favorite topics coming up i have a bunch of uh articles in this section and it is avoiding burnout so i'm going to summarize this section here in a second whether you like it or not if you're in the dog training industry long enough 
you're going to get burnt out. It's just going to happen. It is just absolutely going to happen. Burnout is here to stay. Uh, it is going to happen at some point. The difference is it's just doing something that you like eventually gets exhausting versus doing something that you don't like and you're going to get exhausted anyway. You know, the, the guy stocking shelves at the store, the guy sitting in a cubicle seven, you know, five days a week, or the guy, you know, doing whatever he's not happy doing, he, they're getting burned out. The difference is when we do this, when we do something we love, we don't think burnout is, is, is an issue. I can guarantee you, if you do something you love and you don't take care of yourself, you're going to also get burned out. So you have to be careful with that. And what I do in this section is I give you a couple of tips here. Um, you know, obviously, again, this is a summary, but I'm going to give you some good, good tips here. Something I tell people a lot. Okay. Even if you think, guys, even if you think you're not going to get burnt out, trust me, it's going to happen eventually. Okay. It, it absolutely is. So here are some tips. Tip number one, remember why you started to train dogs. There was some time in your life where you thought this was the coolest thing in the world. And you thought, man, I, I want to do this. I want to I want to work with dogs. How cool would that be? Get paid to just, you know, walk dogs and or work with dogs or groom dogs or pet dogs or train dogs or work with puppies. That would be like the coolest thing in the world. And now you're doing it. But you do it often enough, you do it for so many years, you don't take breaks, you don't take care of yourself, you're going to get exhausted, right? When you start to get exhausted, this is something that has helped me a lot, is I go back to that moment and I think to myself, what could I be doing right now instead? I could be doing something that I'm not very passionate about. I could be doing something that doesn't fulfill me. I could be doing something that doesn't make me or the world any better, but I'm doing this. So even though I'm tired right now, I'm still exactly where I want it to be. And this is still something I'm passionate about. I'm just tired and exhausted. But me remembering my mission and my goal and why I got started, man, it's so motivating. So you have to always periodically, I would say, do that even if you're not if you're not burned out occasionally just stop and realize man what am i do look what i'm doing i'm actually working with dogs and i'm getting paid for it so that's a great tip it's always kind of go back to that and uh you know and appreciate what you do from the perspective of the person you were when you were when you were first getting started Another tip to avoiding burnout is you have to start a hobby. You have to take on a hobby. You 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 have to. Um, you know, I've I've been in the industry for eleven years. There was a period of time where I all I had no choice. I had to think and work with dogs and and breathe dogs and just dogs twenty four seven literally. And I had no choice. I had to do it. But it can get exhausting. So taking on a hobby, even if, like, during that time, I would at least draw. That was my hobby. That was my one thing that took my mind off of things. I would uh, take a few hours, and I would just draw. I wasn't thinking about dogs. The few hours that I had free... And if you're thinking that's impossible, labor laws, you can't do that. You're, you're exaggerating. No, this wasn't in the U.S. This was when I was in Afghanistan and we had a heavy, heavy workload where there were several, several weeks where we'd be working seven days a week. Um, so it does happen. If you run your own business, I guarantee you, you're not going to take Saturday and Sunday off. You're going to be working a lot. 
So again, take on a hobby, even if it's something a few hours a day or even a few hours a week. Doing something that just takes your mind off of things, even for a little bit, what it does is it gives you something to look forward to. That's what it does. It gives you something to look forward to. Where you can go, you know, like at 10 p.m. or so, I'm going to go on my sketchbook and I'm going to draw something. And, and it's like you have your little mental vacation. So taking on a hobby, uh, naturally circumstances might not be as extreme as mine were. Where you could actually take Saturday and Sunday off. Where you could actually go, I'm going to take a few days off and go here. But having that mental break, believe it or not, even if it's a day or even a few hours out of the week, you have got to do it or burnout is going to hit you like a train. So you have to be careful with that. Another tip I talk about in the book is setting goals. You know, like setting little deadlines here and there for you or you know goals like you know it doesn't have to be anything crazy it could be like i'm gonna read i'm gonna read a book in the next month that's gonna be my goal or i'm gonna aim to read a book in the next few months or in the next year my goal is to have read three books Uh, my goal is by the end of this you know uh, this year i'm gonna learn something entirely new i'm gonna go to uh, dog training seminar uh i'm gonna i'm gonna get involved in this sport giving yourself little targets like that gets your mind off of the you know off of the daily grind of just getting a dog out training it putting it back getting the next dog out training it putting it back so on and so forth having these little goals helps tremendously i can tell this from experience as well and the last tip is you know if you if you're really burnt out you can leave you can you can stop training dogs that is perfectly acceptable nobody said that once you start training dogs you have to train dogs for the rest of your life i mean i don't even know if i'm going to be working with dogs my whole life i might move on it just so happens that at this time in my career i'm enjoying it um i feel very motivated to pursue it and I feel very motivated to teaching it to other people. But if at some point this became exhausting, at some point this became not fun anymore, if at some point um, this caused me more aches and more trouble than satisfaction, then I'd definitely leave. You know, you, you're a free person. So moving on is perfectly okay. You moved on from a previous career because you didn't like it. You got in it when you were young, and then as you matured, you realized it wasn't what you wanted to do the rest of your life. Dog training can be the same thing. So you can move on. The one thing I caution you though, and I have this in the book too, is you have to be careful between moving on and quitting. I don't, I don't like the idea of quitting just because I'm tired. There's no way that just because I'm a little burnt out, I'm going to quit and I'm going to do another career. Because if I do that, if I get burnt out and I quit and I move on, I'm going to do the same thing when I go to the next phase of my life. And and I'm going to do that again. And I'm going to repeat the process. I'm going to, it's going to become a cycle. I know people like that, and I'm sure you do too, that... They do a new career. They pursue a career every few years. They do, the, they do something for about three to five years, and then they stop, they leave, they get exhausted, they do something entirely different for another few years, and then they do that again and again and again and again. And you have to be careful that it doesn't become a, a quitting cycle. Sometimes people think that because they're a little bit tired, it means that they don't want to do this anymore. And that's not always the case. If you get a little bit tired and you want to move on, that's not moving on. That's quitting. Okay? Everybody gets burnt out. You have to deal with that. I would move on 
like if I have done everything and I consistently noticed that the emotional struggle and the pain and 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 the toll it takes on my personal life is much much greater than the rewards I get out of it if that was the case then I would move on but if I'm just getting a little bit tired if I get you know if I'm not motivated if I'm a little bit burnt out there's no way I'm going to quit I'm not going to move on from that cuz that that wouldn't be moving on that'd be quitting so you have to be careful with that cuz it can creep up on you and then you don't know whether you're burnt out or you're ready to move on. But if you are ready to move on, move on. That's perfectly fine too. All right, a little bit more uh, on this summary. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, time management. This is something that a lot of us struggle quite a bit. Uh, time management is a huge problem for a lot of dog trainers, I find. And I'm going to get right to it. No fillers here. I want to give you as much value as you possibly can. You're probably driving um, or who knows what you're doing. But I'm going to give you very quickly some strategies on how to maximize time. First, let me tell you, I'm doing this right now while everybody in my family is sleeping. This whole project I've pretty much put together while everybody has been sleeping. Um, I stay up late. And sometimes I get up really early in the morning. And there are times where I've been working on this up until 3, 3.30 in the morning. And I've done several days with just getting five hours of sleep, sometimes less. There have been times where I've been just up for like a couple of hours. And, and then I'm working and then I take another couple of hours nap. And then I'm working and I'm just doing that back and forth. I'm not telling you that to go, oh, wow, you know, you're such a badass. I'm telling you that because I know the struggle of not having enough time. Um, anybody who who has a life that is really worth living, you're going to struggle with that. But the good news is everybody has 24 hours. This is something I joke about, and I don't really joke about it. It's just It comes across as a joke when I talk to my students. You know, there a lot of them are like, you know, 18, right? They just got out of high school. Or I get, you know, students in their 20s. And I suggest, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is the schedule. This is what you're expected to do. And if you want to really excel, I suggest that you are training, you know, um, that you come back after midnight and train, get a few hours of sleep, and then come back and train again, and then recover the rest of your sleep throughout the day here and there. And they laugh, <laughs> they laugh, or they think I'm joking, and they don't realize that that's exactly what I did when I was a student. Um, so 24 hours in a day, uh, first of all, don't, don't expect to get nine hours of sleep, 12 hours of sleep, and get a lot done, okay? Uh, you have to be a little bit consistent and a little bit realistic about um, what a good sleeping pattern is if you are a business owner especially if you're a business owner if you're going to be training dogs for you this can be very very uh, very difficult to manage because especially if you're wearing multiple hats so one good tip or a couple of good tips are there are two types of schedules that will really help you out one's called lumping and the other one's called splitting. And a lot of people don't realize that they're doing splitting and they're just not doing it right. So I'll tell you what lumping is. Lumping is your average nine to five job. So if you work for a company, you are lumping your schedule. That's just, you don't have that option. Right, unless they let you work from home. But if you work from a, for a company, you are lumping your schedule. You show up at a designated time and you work nonstop until you get out of work. So maybe you go in at 8, you work nonstop until noon. 
you get your hour break, and then you work nonstop from one all the way till four or five. And then after that, the schedule is yours to do whatever you want. That's a lumping schedule. If you're a business owner, that can be a little bit difficult, but it can work. Basically what I did uh, when I did dabble in the lumping schedule is I would set my schedule where I would go, okay, I'm gonna be up at six and I'm going to be working with dogs or clients. I'm gonna be answering emails. I'm gonna be uh, out promoting the business. I'm gonna be you know, doing the training sessions. I'm gonna be working on this project and I'm not gonna stop until you know, like, you know, 11 or so. Then I'm gonna take an hour or two of lunch same thing, I'm going to go from like one to like four or five or depending on the workload, you might even do that until six. Once you're done with that, let it all go. Six, limit your schedule and be strict to that. Because if you go, well, it's six, I got six more hours to do a bunch of stuff. You have to be careful with that because again, you're going to run into the burnout. Um, into a little bit of that burnout where if you can be very productive for like 10 hours or however many hours, you got to go, okay, I'm going to take the next five hours or so where I'm just going to just breathe and relax and do something for me and then I'm going to sleep. And then put my nose to the grinder again for another 10 hours the next day or however many hours. Really, you decide what your best schedule is depending on your workload how many projects you have. Now that's lumping. Splitting is what I preferred. And I, I personally like splitting and a lot of business owners without realizing it, they do splitting. Uh, it's just that they don't do it right. Splitting would be this. You go, I'm gonna be up at six in the morning and I'm gonna work nonstop between six and nine in those three hours, I'm just going to grind it all out for three hours straight, like nonstop. I'm going to be as productive as I possibly can be. From nine till noon or whatever, I'm just giving you a, a hypothetic example here. From nine till noon, all right, hypothetic, you can go, I'm just going to relax. I'm going to do my shopping. I'm going to... Uh, exercise, I'm going to have a nice big meal, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with my family, and and you know, I'm going to spend time with my dogs, I'm going to train for myself, and I'm going to do that those three hours. And then you can go, okay, from noon until three, I'm going to grind nonstop, nose to the grinder, back and forth, back and forth, I'm going to you know, run, I'm going to just do as much as I can for the business. You know, I'm going to do all my emails, all my advertising, all my marketing, all my training, just nonstop from noon until three. And then you can go, okay, I'm done, right? It's three. I'm going to take the next two hours to spend time with my family. I'm going to take the next two hours to draw or engage in whatever hobby you're engaging in. Right? And then you could go, okay, from five till eight, I'm gonna again grind it. I'm gonna grind it. Right. You're gonna go train dogs, answer emails, call clients, market your business, do whatever you have to for the business, right? And then go, okay, it's eight. And now from eight till uh, from 8 to 10, it's going to relax. And then you can go, okay, I'm going to just give it one more hour, two more hours of work, and then I'm going to go to sleep after that. So basically, splitting means you're allocating pieces of your day to your, to your work or to your business. And then you also, by default, have those other pieces allocated to you. So we're lumping, you could work nonstop until five. This is hypothetical, of course. This is going to vary from schedule to schedule, from person to person. But for example, for, for like lumping, you could work until five and then have the rest of the day off, 
with splitting, you work throughout the day and you get pieces of that schedule towards you. And I prefer that because it allows me to be productive throughout the day. And it gives me time to kind of rest a little bit throughout the day too. Uh, whereas the lumping, I mean, I do work for a company. So Monday through Friday, I am lumping my schedule. Um, when I get home, I'm also working on my business. On the weekends, depends on the workload that I have on the weekends. Some, some weekends I lump and I'm working all day. And there are some days on the weekends where I'm just splitting my schedule, where I'm working a few hours here, taking a little bit of a break. Working a few hours, taking a couple of hours to spend with my family. And, you know, work a few more hours on my project, take a few hours to work in the yard, so on and so forth. So really, if you understand what lumping looks like and you understand what splitting looks like and you stick to it, it's amazing what you can get done. Where people get in trouble is they do like half lumping and half splitting. <laughs> and they go, I'm just going to work until 5 and then I'm going to stop. And then what happens is they're supposed to be lumping their schedule until 5. But in reality, they're just splitting their schedule until 5. And they've only put in like 3 hours of work or 4 hours of work the entire day. And then by 5, they're exhausted because they, they're not focused. They've BS around the whole time. They've gone back and forth between working on their business and checking Facebook. And then by five, they're tired and now they go, oh my God, I worked all day and they really haven't. Right? And then they're falling behind. Their dogs are not getting trained. Their clients, they're not getting back to. I've seen it. I, I see it happen. I see it, I see it with trainers that you know supposedly lump their schedule, but they really don't. And they're just not getting anything done. But to them, it looks like they are. To them, it feels like they're working a lot. But in reality, they're not. So if you understand those two types of schedule, man, it really helps you a lot. So that's a little bit on, uh, on business management and avoiding burnout as well. So now let's go into... Um, into another section, right? Uh, this one is going to be, this one is going to be how to use Facebook groups. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a summary on that. All right, so Facebook groups, you might you might go, okay, this, this chapter is stupid. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. The whole thing with Facebook is social media in general, you have to be careful with. Um, there, there was a time where Facebook dog groups were cool, where you could go, wow, this is awesome. I could join a Facebook group and I could talk to a bunch of like-minded individuals and find other dog trainers. But as the years went by, everybody decided to open a Facebook dog group. And now it's just a joke. And there's a Facebook group for everything out there literally everything there's like facebook dog groups for ridiculous things here's the problem with that facebook dog groups can be great for making connections and uh and expanding your network but at the same time it's also full of bs all right so here are some of the things that you want to be careful with Right, because you, you can use Facebook dog groups properly, but they can also become very, very destructive. So one, stay away from people who want free advice. Don't even comment on those. I used a long time ago, I used to. I was like, oh, I'm gonna help this person out. They really are asking for help. They're in a Facebook dog group, and I'm gonna be out there, I'm gonna help them out. You're wasting your time. Don't even do it. Because here's, here's what's going to happen. This person probably doesn't even know the problem that they have. I mean, think about it. If, you, if you're incompetent, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. And I'm not saying that to be condescending. But if you're incompetent enough 
about the dog that you have and you don't know what you're looking at and you don't know how to fix it because you don't know what you're looking at and and then you go well i'm gonna bring this to a facebook dog group and i'm gonna ask a bunch of strangers how to how i can fix this that already tells me that because you don't actually know what's happening because you're asking for help naturally so you don't know what's happening you're very likely not going to put the accurate representation of the problem when you write your post. Okay, does that make sense? Think about it. If if I don't know um, why my car is making a certain noise, and I have no idea, I'm clueless as to why my car is making a certain noise, and I go to a Facebook group for like mechanics, and I go, hey, um, my car is making this very high-pitched noise. <laughs> and I think it's coming from the tires. Could you help me fix that? Well, it might actually not be coming from the tires. It might actually be coming from the, from the, uh, you know, from the, from the front part of the car. Right. If I go, my car is making some rattling, rattling sounds, and I think it's coming from, from my radiator. But in reality, it maybe it's not even coming from the radiator. Maybe it's coming from the from from an entirely different part of the vehicle. One, I'm telling you about a problem that's really not even there. Now you are gonna tell me, oh well, if it's your if it's your tire, it's probably your brakes. So here's what you have to do. Go get your brakes brake pass changed. <laughs> now I go to a mechanic and I go, or or I ask my friend, hey, can you change my brake pads? We change my brake pads, and the sound doesn't go away. Because what happened here is I saw a problem that I'm not familiar with about a topic that I am not familiar with. And so I wrote my version of the story on a post, which is not the accurate rep accurate representation of what's happening. Now somebody else is going to look at my post and go, oh, he has problems with his tires. Here's what you need to do. Now I'm going to take that and I'm going to try to apply that to a problem that is not even the problem to begin with, right? Especially if you tell me, oh, Will, here's what you have to do. If it is your tires, which it sounds like it is, and keep in mind, probably not even my tires, this person might tell me, well, uh, put the jack under the frame in your car, right behind the front tire, if that's where you think it's coming from, jack the front of the car up, lock it, um, you know, first loosen loosen your uh, lug nuts and then jack it up and then pull it out. And then you're going to grab the clippers. You're going to loosen it. You're going to pull it out and you're going to pull out the brake pads and install brand new brake pads. Pull the calipers down, tighten it up, and then you're going to slide your tie back up. And then, you know, you're going to bring the jack down and then you're going to be good to go. Well, then that sound on your tire is going to be gone. So now you're telling me how to do this, and I'm going to try my, keep in mind, I don't know about cars that well. That's why I'm writing this problem on a Facebook group. So now I'm going to go, okay, he said to jack the tire up first. Okay, no, he said loosen up the lug nuts. I'm going to be all messed up, and I'm going to actually mess up my tires or my brake pads entirely because I don't even know what I'm doing. Right? That's exactly what happens with dog training groups. Somebody will go on there saying, my dog is doing this. I think it's because it's been this, this, and that. What do you guys think? And then you get like 50 people that are giving all kinds of different advice to this person, who is, by the way, clueless. And they're giving advice based on what this person is writing, which might not even be the true problem. And now this person is going to try to implement, the person is going to try to pick all of these, right? Try to pick one of these 
whatever this person thinks is the best fit. And then they're going to try to implement it to their dog, which by the way, they still have no clue how to address this. Do you see already how terrible this is? This is why you have to stay away from that, that kind of post. It's not good for you. It's exhausting. It's very irritating. And then somebody else is going to say something that you know, like they're going to tell some, they're going to tell the person, hey, no, 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 this is what you want to do. And you're going to be like, where the hell did you learn how to work with dogs? Because what you're telling this person to do is going to get that person hurt. So it's just not even worth the, the headache. Another pe person post to stay away from is people who, who want to prove a point. Uh, people who are there just to win arguments, not even worth it. Okay. Uh, content that you find offensive. <laughs> this is, I do run a Facebook, I have a Facebook group. It's for my, for my protection club. And I also have a Facebook page. And the number of people that get offended by some of my content baffles me. Which I get it. Not every post is for you. But if you're going to get offended, move the hell on. And following all these Facebook dog groups, sometimes you're going to get offended. So move on. It's just, it's, it's just not productive and it's not good for you. There are There is content in some of these Facebook dog groups that I find repulsive. I've seen Facebook dog groups that post dogs getting killed, like literally dogs dying on video uh, or dogs just getting like beat, like dogs just like being abused, like literally abused. And the, the person running the group is saying, oh, this is just for discussion purposes. <laughs> now, obviously, um, whatever morbid uh, agenda there is, I'm sure it's more than just, you know, discussion purposes. Um, but, you know, whatever the case might be, obviously, that is content that I have zero interest in discussing about. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm going to move on. I'm just going to keep scrolling. But Facebook dog groups, because they're private, a lot of them are private and they screen their members very well. So they don't just accept anybody. Um, they, a lot of times get away with posting some very horrible things on there because they have a very tight group. So you have to be careful with those. The content of some of these Facebook dog groups, it's just repulsive. But now here are some things that you can, uh, you know, some, some things that Facebook dog groups can be beneficial for. You can actually find like-minded people. You can stay up to date with the news. There are times where I found out things about the dog training industry, not through the news medias, not through... Um, you know, not through ads, but through Facebook dog groups. Uh, so that's one thing that Facebook seems to be pretty good at is pushing headlines. Uh, you know, it takes one person to share a very controversial news update regarding the dog training industry. It goes viral and that's how you get your news. So that's one good way to, I guess, stay up to date is by following some of these Facebook dog groups. So that could be, you know, that could also be beneficial. So there's definitely some good things to that. All right. So now we're going to be touching on a different topic, different uh, this is now the last section that I'm going to be covering, and it is going to be on uh, dog owner info. So choosing the right dog and when should you start training your puppy. So choosing the right dog. Summarizing these two because they kind of go a little bit back to back, a little bit hand in hand. 
Uh, so when you choose the right dog, you have to realize that dogs are unique individuals. So every dog is going to be unique. And, um, and here's the thing. Rescue organizations, shelters are not the best people to go to to help you find the right dog. Um, more than likely, you're going to have to either do your own research. Um, if you're just a dog owner, re, uh, listening to this. If you're not a dog trainer, or even if you are a dog trainer and you're kind of new, really do your research. I hear of dog trainers or quote-unquote dog trainers the dog training industry is just becoming a joke every single day, I swear. This is a little bit of a rant. But anyway, let me get back to the summary. The dog training industry has a lot of dog trainers that don't even know how to choose their own dogs. So whether you're a dog trainer or a dog person, you have to really do your research. And if you're not sure, contact a more qualified dog trainer. Somebody who's been in the industry a little bit longer, somebody who has more experience with the breed that you're contemplating, and really look into the different breeds. Or if you have a breed in mind, really, really look into that breed and don't get emotional about it. The next thing I suggest doing when choosing the right dog is really take a look at your lifestyle. Take an inventory of your, of your lifestyle at the moment and think to yourself, is this something I can do? Dogs are almost, it's almost like having a part-time job. It's not just, you know, taking the dog out and cuddling with it and, and going for walks. There is responsibility, okay? And, uh, and you might actually have the right lifestyle for that dog. I'm not saying you don't. But especially if you're looking for a working dog, you really have got to take inventory of your lifestyle. If you're looking at a working dog, their needs are higher. Their, their needs for fulfillment are higher than, than a dog that is not that type of dog, that is not a working dog. So you have to be very careful with the proper matchmaking and genetic tendencies and your lifestyle, they need to match a little bit. Okay, another, another suggestion that I give is forget about the looks. Don't be emotional about picking a dog. It's really, really, it's all about the match. It's not about the looks. This is whether you adopt a dog from the rescue or whether you get a dog from a breeder. I have, I've, I've had clients who have needed my assistance because they chose the dog for the wrong reasons. And they were like, oh, you know, we thought he was just so adorable. And then this dog ended up being a nightmare for them. Not because the dog was a nightmare. It's because they just weren't prepared to deal with that type of dog. Um, even if you go, well, well, I don't care. Well, I want, a, I want a German Shepherd. I want a Malinois. I want a Busseron. I want, I want a, uh, you know, a Collie. Whatever it is that you want, where you go, I want this breed, and I've already done my research, and I, and I want it, and I'm prepared, and I got the right lifestyle. Still, within that breed, you could still go. Well, that one is kind of dark. <laughs> I, I don't know if I want the dark one. Or this one is, you know, this one's kind of light. I think I prefer the light one. Forget about the looks even then. Go which personality, which temperament type will best suit my lifestyle. Okay, that's the way to do it. Um, again, I see people choose dogs based on looks exclusively. And even if they have the right breed in mind, they go, well, I want this type or I want this color or I want this height or I want this weight and to a degree yeah that can be accommodated but don't pass up a good dog just because it doesn't mean your looks criteria okay um, there are some really nice dogs that 
I don't even, I mean, there are breeds that I don't even like. Just flat out, there are breeds that I'm just not going to go out of my way and go, I want to find a good breeder for this breed so that I can get one. It's just not going to happen. But there are certain individuals from those breeds that I don't like that I've fallen in love with. And it had nothing to do with the looks. It had everything to do with their personality. It had everything to do with their temperament. It had everything to do with their drive. So looks should be the least of your priorities. As far as when to start training them, the sooner the better. This is something I touch on here in the the book. And I go, look, even if you get that puppy at seven weeks of age, you got to train that puppy right away. That doesn't mean you take him to a dog training school. That doesn't mean you do your group classes. I mean, what are you going to do with a seven-week-old at a group class where there's going to be, you know, four-month-old puppies and six-month-old puppies? Just generally not a good idea unless the trainer knows what they're doing. But there's a lot you can do with a seven-week-old puppy at your house. You can do crate training. You can do potty training. You could do target training. You could do place, puppy manners. There is so many things you can do with a puppy. Uh, the the old saying, and, and I go into a little more detail here in the book, is, you know, the old saying, this is like old school training mentality was, you need to wait till the puppy's six months of age before you start training it. That was the norm. That was what people recommended. There are books on the subject, you know, on dog training from decades ago. If you read them, they'll tell you exactly that. You'll see them, you know, don't start training until the puppy's six six months of age. And the reason for that is, you know, back in those days, back when training was different, training has evolved now, but back when training was, you know, more on the high pressure side, it made sense to wait till the puppy was six months of age because the puppies would be, you know, the dogs would be trained with choke chains and there'd be pressure and there'd be, you know, pressure into the sit and pressure into the heel. And it was done with a choke chain and it was, you know, some popping and yanking and and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not judging. This is just, this was the norm back in those days so naturally you can't do that with a seven week old puppy so the suggestion was wait till they're six months of age now training has evolved you do not need to do that right Uh, you can start training as soon as you get that puppy home it doesn't matter how old they are even if they're seven weeks of age or they're seven years of age or they're 10 years of age. And people sometimes feel sorry for their dogs. They're like, oh, you know, this is a senior dog. I can't do anything with them. No, you can still do quite a bit with that dog. So senior dogs, young puppies, there is a lot that can still be done. Going back to the article that I talked about earlier, balanced versus force-free or purely positive, that's one great application for purely positive training. You got your six-week-old puppy, your seven-week-old puppy. You got your senior dog, your geriatric dog. Training can still be very, very motivational, very, very purely positive. A lot of shaping, a lot of luring, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, capturing. And that is a great application for that type of training. So training should take place immediately. All right, so that concludes the summary of this book. Hopefully, I didn't put you to sleep. And if I did put you to sleep, hopefully, you're not driving. Um, I'm going to just wrap this up with the summary or the conclusion. I'm sorry, I'm going to wrap up the summary with the conclusion. And we'll end it with that. So I also have this in the full audio. But a few things that I have learned in this, you know, in this 11 years working with dogs and working with people. And that is, you really do not need another brand new system of dog training out there. 
there there is the fundamentals and if you master the fundamentals everything else gets easier once you master the fundamentals the problem is when people don't master the fundamentals but they want to master all the complex new techniques out there but once you really become good and you really understand you don't even have to be good but you really understand the super basic principles of operant conditioning classical conditioning just learning theory in general once you really understand that and you grasp it you'll realize every other book out there, including this one, everything, every new technique out there, it all boils down to the basics, okay? Every single new technique out there will always have the basics. And when you see bullshit, it's a lot easier to find the bullshit when you master the basics. When you don't master the basics, you don't understand the basics, you see bullshit, it looks like flowers because the person pushing out the bullshit they're painting it like flowers once you understand it you can smell right through that so that's one thing i've learned in my in my uh first decade working with dogs and working with a lot of people uh, i've been very fortunate again like i said uh, i've i've worked in different areas of dog training and i've also worked with a lot of huge names in the industry. I mean, I've talked to and I've spent time with and I've learned from top performers in their industry. I don't mean like your, you know, your your shitty YouTube person with like a bunch of followers. I mean people who have actually accomplished a world like a, a made a huge difference in the dog training industry. Uh, world class competitors, amazing dog trainers. I've been fortunate to have learned from them, and uh, and I can tell you, man, like really, they they really they don't even have that air air of arrogance. They really still have that, you know. I still have to learn more, and uh, and it's just so great to see that from them. All right, so here's here are some things that I have learned in in, in you know in my time in the dog training industry. Dogs are individuals; no two are alike. Dogs have predictable yet complex learning mechanisms and patterns. Biting is always an option. I've learned this the hard way many times. You can spend two lifetimes, two lifetimes learning about dogs and still have a lot to learn at the end of the second life. And the person who believes they know everything is a fool. You need to stay as, as far away from them as possible. And obviously, a little bit about the author. I told you about myself already, so I'm not going to talk too much about me. Um, the reason is, I, this isn't about bragging. This isn't about me telling you you should listen to this book or read this book. Um, but in general, you know, I have um, I have learned a lot, and I still have a lot to learn. But the one thing I do know is, I I know that. I can learn from a lot of people that are, you know, a few years ahead of me. I can learn from a lot of people that have uh, maybe even less time than I do in the industry. And I know that, um, you know, that just dog training is it's an endless journey. You're always going to be out there learning if you are willing to learn. Dog training schools that I've gone to, I already mentioned Star Mark Academy uh, or Triple Crown Academy at the time. And um, U.S. Canine Unlimited, Roger Abshire. So uh, if anything, a little bit of a shout out to those two companies. I've learned a lot from uh, from Roger, uh, the system at Triple Crown Academy. Um, I really liked. I learned a lot from them. And just the different companies that I have worked for, I've also have learned a lot of what to do and equally important, what not to do. Hope you enjoyed this, and hopefully uh, you'll get to see some of, some of my other products, some of my other books, and we get to meet each other sometime if we haven't already.